Would you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day. For the opportunity to come to hear your holy word and to receive the sacrament that your Son prepared so readily and so wonderfully for us. So open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our souls to all that you have to say to us through him. That the great and wonderful joy of your salvation will lead us each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may these blessings be multiplied upon each and every one of you. Amen. Quite a world we live in. 9-11, how many thousands of people were killed by people taking over three airplanes and crashing them, and killing people in New York. And since that time, how many more thousands upon thousands have been killed by people who in the name of their religion have brought to death so many. And yesterday we saw, if you watched television, what happened in Paris. What a world. Did Jesus talk about this kind of a world in which you and I live? <coughs> Let's you and I take a good look at this text. First of all, Jesus is leaving the synagogue. You have to remember now, this is the last week before he goes to the cross. He will not enter the synagogue again. The last time. When they came out, the disciples said to him, Lord, look at these magnificent stones. What magnificent buildings. You know, I got to watch last night the 125th anniversary film of this congregation. What a joy that was. And then this past summer, I got to preach at the 100th anniversary of my congregation in Deer Creek. And I'm not as old as any of them. But what has happened in the world since these two congregations began their life? World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and in between all kinds of things happening in this world, you know, along with our battles in Iraq and Afghanistan, and all of a sudden we're directed our attention to the temple. What massive stones. Do you know how big those stones were that they built the temple with? One of the stones, the stones were 37 feet long. You got that? That's about from here to the to the Narthex. 37 feet long. And 18 feet wide and 12 feet high. Now just think about how massive just one of those stones was. They had to go and cut that, st that stone out of quarry and somehow or other bring it all the way into Jerusalem, lay it in place, and in the meantime be cutting other stones and then having to lift them one upon the other. Wow! No wonder it took about a hundred years to build a, build a temple. But the work that went into it, massive stones. I've often wondered why in the world they had to have such big stones. But who knows? And a magnificent building. So much of it covered with gold. Just think what it would be like if all of these walls were painted with gold. Real gold, not gold paint, but real gold. Wouldn't that be something? That's what these people went to worship in. And when people 
people stop to think about their churches and think they're going to be here for a long time. But then I remember seeing on the, the DVD, the front of the building was blown off by a storm. Rocks laying on the front. Okay? So at that time they decided they're going to go on to the front. <laughs> you know? Nothing is forever. And this temple was going to go. In about 72 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. We'll get into that a little bit in Bible class. I hope you'll all come. Bring your bulletins along with you, because I'm going to be talking about the Old Testament and the Epistle of the Gospel. But I'm covering the Gospel this morning in the sermon. But anyway, all of these things are going to be thrown down. The people at that time had no idea of the violence of the Roman armies and what was going to happen. Then he went out of the city with his disciples and four of them, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, came up and talked to him alone, privately. What must it have been like? Just picture yourself in that place. Up on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the temple, seeing that magnificent building, and the whole city of Jerusalem laid out before you. And you get to sit down and talk with Jesus. Wow. But what they were concerned about is, Lord, when are these things going to happen? And what are the signs that we can look forward to see that it's going to come up and we can get out of the way? We don't want to be in the midst of all of that. And now Jesus talks to them and to us. Be careful that no one deceives you. Do we have deceiving people in our world today? Some of them try to do it by good works, others by violence. The stories that I've heard, for example, of what ISIS and ISIL have done to Christian families. Demanding that these people convert to Islam or die. When they won't do it, they will behead their children right in front of the parents. Just think what that would be like. If you were standing there and you saw your child having its head cut off, by violence, this is the way some people live. Then it will come in my name, claiming I am he, and it will deceive many. How do you think the Mormon church got started? by somebody claiming to be like Christ. And by the way, Christ is not a God to them. He was just a man. Deceiving many, look how many thousands belong to that church body. Deceived, many of them former Christians, going back to the, to the 1800s, is it happening today? Oh, by all means. Just reading about Wadena. Did you read about that in the paper or hear about it? Wadena's always had a, a crush there at Christmas time on one of his parks. And then a group against religion demanded that they not put it up this year. Or they were to sue. So the Wadena City Council said, no, we won't put it up. <laughs> they give in to those people who are more likely than atheists. The pressures used in the courts against the Christian faith is happening over and over and over again. So many are deceived. Our children go to 
to school. I don't know what it was like when you went to school. Could you pray? Was God talked about? What was your Christmas program all about? I remember singing in one of those Christian programs, Christmas programs, when I was in the fourth grade. And the superintendent came up to me the next day and shook my hand in the hall and said, good job. <laughs> you know? But I could sing about Christ. Can you do that today? Not in most schools. And we also have been asked by a president to open up a classroom for the Muslims to have a place to pray. Where is a room for Christians to go and pray? It's not there. We are facing all kinds of obstacles in our world. Such deception. And I think of Jesus' words, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Boy, have we ever gone through those. It's still going on. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. I was remember reading oh, about a month ago about the people in Nebraska being terribly concerned because of all the earthquakes they're having there. Can you imagine? Earthquakes in Nebraska? I can imagine that in California. <laughs> or in the, the Rocky Mountains. And famines. How many millions of people are not being able to eat today? Because they have no food. And they have governments that don't take care of them and help them. These are just the beginnings of birth pains. I've never gone through that. I know some ladies who have, okay? Six times. But what Jesus was simply saying is, it's going to hurt. And this is just the beginning. You and I are in the midst of that beginning. We're living in that world. Wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation, people against people, religion against religion. And then he says, this is where I got the theme for the text, guard yourself. Guards of your head. You must be on your guard. When I was in the service, had to have guard duty. Well, that was one of the great joys. <laughs> I see there are two here with a kind of smirk on their face. <laughs> there you were in the middle of the night walking a certain place, you know, where you've got a walk and you've got a rifle, you know, in your hands and waiting for somebody to come who's not supposed to be there. And you pray that nobody ever comes. Because you don't know what the world is going to happen. Be on guard. I mean, you just, in the service, you've got to do that. That's all there is to it because of the enemies that are facing us. But you are to be on guard. And you young people, I especially want to talk to you right now. You're living in a world that wants to get rid of Christ and his salvation. How many places are we hearing that Christ never existed? I have a brother-in-law who believes that. We're hearing this over and over again. And how many people are trying to tell us that he was not truly God?
And if you is not God, then his death on the cross was simply the death of a man. It has no meaning whatsoever. How many thousands upon thousands did the Romans crucify? This is just one. But in this one case, it was God on that cross dying for us in the form of a man. We have to be on our guard, folks. We're in a world that wants to take that faith away from us. Many cases, people are, Christians are being handed over to parts of their government and are being put to death because of their faith. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. And come to me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to that. I don't imagine, I don't remember ever being flogged in a synagogue, but I know our faith has been. Our faith has been fought there, beat with words. They don't want to believe that Christ truly was the Messiah. Promised by God. But don't be afraid of what you're going to say. When people ask you, about your faith. I know that we go through and say, well, what we've got to do is we've got to, like Katie there, you've got to really give them a good education in the Christian faith. Bring them up. Luther's Catechism, you know, in the Bible, get to know God's Word, memorize Bible verse after Bible verse. I wonder how many we memorize in Catechism. Sometimes when we are confronted, we forget everything. We're dumbstruck, not able to speak. But Jesus says, don't worry beforehand about what you're going to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And if you ever want to know someone who is speaking because the Holy Spirit is giving him the words, talk to me. What do you think I pray for? When I kneel before a congregation or stand before a congregation about ready to proclaim God's word, Lord, fill my mind with your thoughts, my mouth with your words, my heart with your love. And no matter how much work I put into a sermon, you have no idea how many things come out of my mouth that I had not planned on. The Holy Spirit is at work. He wants to preserve his truth, his word. He doesn't want Martin Langham to just spoil it in any way. So, and Jesus goes on to say this. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. I don't know if any of you remember reading about the Soviet Union during the time of Stalin. How many children turned in their parents because they were Christians? And those parents were taken to the Stalags, and there they died. Because the communist youth had been imbibed with this whole idea that Christianity is wrong, it goes against the state and the teachings of communism. Now, anybody who believes those things must be put to death. So these children turned their parents in. 
their brothers, their brothers, and sisters, their sisters. And that's happening today in the Middle East. Jesus knew what he was talking about. He always did. He was truly God. He looked at the days in which you and I will live. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And everyone will hate you because of me. But you guard your faith. Study it. Pray about it. Go to church. Remember that part in the readings from, from the uh, letter to the Hebrews? Some people don't go to church anymore. I used to see more people sitting in the pews. And a lot more young people. I've preached at churches where I saw nothing but gray hairs. Marty was telling me about a congregation here where there are no children, no confirmation classes, no Sunday school. How can that be? How can that be? Guard your faith. Hold on to it with both hands and with the great joy in your heart that Christ has given you by his death and on the cross. And remember his word, his promise to you. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. So when he comes again, and the trumpet blows. As you and I have passed away and fallen asleep in Christ, our bodies will be raised up, joined with our souls, and we will join Christ in the air, along with all of those people who still believe. I'm looking forward to that day. So one of my prayers is to come quickly. Lord Jesus, look at the mess we have to live in. But come quickly. And in the meantime, guard your faith. Don't let anyone take it away from you. Hold on to it. It's the greatest gift you've ever been given. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in that one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.